My name is Warren Brush. I'm the executive director of Quail Springs Permaculture, and we're a farm out on the far reaches uh, of Ventura County up in the upper Cuyama Valley. We're probably one of the farthest properties out from Ventura proper, but we still are in Ventura County, and we are um, developing uh, our site to be able to rejuvenate a really badly damaged landscape that had been overgrazed and mismanaged for over 120 years. And we've developed a plan over the next 200 years to bring this landscape back into its full abundance and, um, and, and creating a, a learning site for people to understand better how to create healthy shelter, healthy water sources, and abundant, stable, and resilient water sources how to create food systems that don't degrade the land but actually support a, a, a recovering ecology. Um, we also work with energy systems that work with real-time sunlight rather than fossilized sunlight like we have with our fossil fuels. Um, this site has been uh, developing for over eight years. Um, it was started back in uh, 2003 and we're we're in our eighth year right now and we're we're moving right along and it's a it's a wonderful site as you see behind me i'm in a building that is uh, a natural building that is made with straw bales it's made with uh, the straw bales are pinned with the rundo grasses um, like the ones that are being sprayed and killed off in other parts of Ventura County as a nuisance, yet it has all of these different purposes that we can put to good use like building a building. Um, this is a good example of repurposing something you see as a, as a negative on the landscape and actually turning a problem into a solution, which is one of the principles of permaculture. Um, this building um, fits into the permaculture principles. Um, a lot of you might be asking, well, what is permaculture? Permaculture is a design science where we are consciously designing our landscapes to harmonize with nature and doing it in a way that brings abundance, that brings stability, resilience, and diversity in a system that creates, that, that be eventually becomes sustainable. Um, a design science that is really linking all the other sciences together in a heartful way. And, and we're uh, an international movement that was started out of Australia. We're in 160 countries. It's believed that we, there are over 850,000 projects that are on the ground in these 160 countries. And that we are feeding more people than all the World Food Aid organizations combined. And so it's a, it's a movement to be uh, definitely to be reckoned with. And we're starting to see permaculture spring up in universities all over America. We're seeing it all over in, in every country. It's starting to become a well-known word. And so if you haven't heard of it yet, do an internet search, Google it, and find all the amazing projects that are truly um, changing our landscapes so that we, we can live in a sustainable and harmonic manner with, with, the, with the, all of that that sustains us. So one of the things that we're really well known for here at Quail Springs is our work to develop and to legalize natural building practices that create non-toxic buildings that are ecologically equitable and that can be built by people with uh, varied skill levels. Um, this particular building, as you can look around, is a straw bale building pinned with the Arundo grass. It's got a clay um, plaster system that is bound with wheat rather than highly toxic glues. Um, one of the things you'll see um, when you come and you, you touch a building like this that is made of natural materials is that they're there's a different feel to them than the highly industrialized materials that are used in the conventional building um, practices that we find in most of our buildings. Um, I was recently looking at a statistic that said um, that the average home in America has at least 10,000 toxic chemicals in it. And a building like this, we're just not going to have it. And we thought, oh, you know, as, as uh, Americans, as Californians, that we could, we could propose a building that would be able to meet our needs of being completely non-toxic and still be able to work within the conventional permitting process or the regulations that are there. And surprisingly, what we found is that it is illegal in the state of California to build a non-toxic building. We could not find a legal pathway to actually make a building 
that had no toxins in it. Um, there were too many uh, pieces that were required of us that actually required us to bring in non -to or to bring in highly in industrialized processed materials that were highly toxic. Um, interestingly enough, as you start to look at the history of where we are in America as far as, far as that relates to cancer, if you look at the 1800s to the 1900s, the instance of cancer was about one in 8,000. Um, recently, the American Cancer Society released statistics saying that be, all of us that are watching this right now are a part of this uh, television show right now, that the average that we'll see cancer surfacing in one of us is one in two in men and one in three in women. Now, granted, there's been a lot more uh, development and discovery of cancers, and um, there's been a lot since the 1800s, but even if it was one in 100 people in the 1800s or the 1900s, and now it's one in two and one in three, we see that we have an epidemic that is really focused on the industrial world. And it is the disease of the industrial world. I, get, I work all over Africa, and I work in many other countries. And one of the things I hear from Americans is that you know, those poor people have such, you know, their, their epidemics that they have, the AIDS epidemic, the malaria, the cholera. But what we what we'd forget is that we have probably one of the worst epidemics in the history of humanity, which is the toxicity issues causing cancers within us. And um, we have to do something about it, whether it's stopping people from, uh, or governments and organizations and businesses like Monsanto from spraying in our watersheds chemicals that are um, highly toxic to not only the human environment, but to all of our other friends on the earth, all of the other living beings on the earth, and not knowing what the cumulative effects of toxins are. Um, some of these toxins are tested in isolation, not in accumulation with others. So when you start to think of 10,000 toxic chemicals possible in a house, if not more, we have to really rethink the way we're building. In addition to that, we're also experimenting with how do we work with natural materials from the landscape in which the house needs to be built. Um, and from here, the, the vernacular here is mud. It's clay, earth. It's clay, sand, and straw that we're building with. Um, we have uh, uh, another building I'd like to show you later in the broadcast that is made of just that, clay, sand, and straw. And it's one of the most beautiful buildings we have on this property. So we're going uh, we're gonna to go out onto the landscape right now and, and take a look at some of the work we've been doing. Um, when we first came here, this landscape was completely barren. Um, it had been grazed by cattle for over 120 years. And what you see now, the tree systems you see now, all but one tree has been planted by us. Well, I'd like to take you around and show you a little bit about what we've been up to, all, a lot of the different systems that we've been designing in the land here, and looking at some of the things we've been learning and some of the things that we've, uh, some of our successes and some of our failures. Um, we find that our failures are just as important as our successes in the learning process. So why don't you come along? So this is uh, another way that we use natural building materials. This is also clay, sand, and straw. We use them to actually create these, what we call cob ovens. Uh, these two ovens uh, cook a lot of our bread. They, they bake the chickens that are grown on the land. They, they cook uh, all the vegetables that we grow. And they're a wonderful way to simply build a oven system without having to use a lot of steel and gas and all sorts of stuff. We use just scrap wood and we uh, were able to cook some beautiful feasts here. What I'd like to show you next is we have a group of um, farm interns um, that we have here helping us over these next, uh, these next few months. And uh, they're working on building compost. Composting is probably one of the most important things we can do to actually rebuild the ecologies of the landscapes in which we live. Uh, fertility is such an important part of feeding the people. So let's come on over and have a look at what they're doing with the compost piles. All right, so here we're uh, working on chopping up some cattail reeds, which is another great use of uh, typha, or cattail, uh, to create um, carbon for the, the compost. So compost is a mix of nitrogen and carbon. You should come and get a smell of this stuff. This is stuff that's come from our goats and our chickens. It's been processing all of our old food right through the, the bellies of our chickens. Um, we, uh, we've then process it through the goat pens, and we've, we've got uh, a beautiful compost that comes out of this that then fertilizes a lot of our plants. And uh, 
It's completely non-toxic. It's, it's healthy for the land. It's healthy for us to work with. And it's a great way of taking a waste and turning it into food. If you spend a little bit of time uh, working on creating these compost piles, you never have to buy fertilizer. And you certainly don't ever need to buy toxic fertilizers. You don't need to buy uh, industrially produced fertilizers. You can make your fertilizer at home. I'd like to ask Ventura County, is I'd like to Ventura County to look and, and ask themselves when they start looking at the long-term effects of the chemicals that are being sprayed into the watershed, of how's that going to affect the future generations? What are we going to have to carry? Not only now people are getting sick from it, but all of the unknowns of all of the uh, the combinations of, of effects that will happen from these toxic chemicals that we're spraying, like we understand its, its effect on the ecologies in which they're spraying, and we don't understand that. And they can't say that they understand it. The studies that have been done on it have been done in a laboratory, not in the bounty and diversity of nature. And so we're playing with fire when we start looking at the, the chemical effects, the long-term chemical effects of spraying for something like Arundo. And when we look at Arundo, people have demonized this plant, and yet it has found a niche that has not been filled by other plants. We need to, to recognize that it's actually playing an important role in that ecology right now. And that if, yeah, exactly it's not a native, right, but there are a lot of things that aren't native, like most of us who are watching this aren't native to this landscape. And we have to really think of, you know, when we look and start demonizing plants, we need to look at their function and what is their utility. Can we convert that problem, so to speak, into a solution, which is really what we're, what we're all about when we start looking at permaculture. So what could the solution be? The solution could be that we create building materials, that we create, we actually uh, use them, the, the Arundo can be converted to so many things that we're currently cutting trees down for. Um, why don't we stop cutting the trees down, which are a part of keeping our healthy uh, hydrological systems working. We need our trees, and yet we're cutting them down for things that we don't need to. We can stop spraying and use the Arundo for a lot of different things. I know of places in Cambodia that are using similar uh, types of plants to actually fuel um, really high efficient gasifier systems that are producing energy for large cities or large uh, villages of over 5,000 people. I mean, we could convert it to energy. Um, there's so many things that we could do. We need to be more creative. Shame on us if we can't change that. We need to rethink our process and be hopeful about it. Rather than going in and using chemicals from warfare on our landscapes, we need to rethink and be smart. We're a smart people. We're a smart people and we have the tools and we already know how to deal with this. We just need to come to consensus with it. So I beckon you, Ventura County, to please join with us in coming up with real solutions that are good for the next seven generations to come for all beings. So we're going to go in to look at some of our, our very simple, very beautiful, very um, efficient animal systems. Come on, let's go. So here's another good use of uh, clay, sand, and straw. You'll see throughout uh, our tour here that we use clay, sand, and straw for just about everything. It's, it's one of the most versatile building materials there are. This is actually the edge, uh, the western edge, of a rabbit system where we actually raise rabbits for, um, for one, their beauty, but also for their meat and also for their skins. Come on in. Let's have a look. So this is... Uh, these, these rabbits are, um, as you know, breed like rabbits, and we um, are taking after the French who uh, consider rabbit to be one of the top foods, one of the top meats uh, to be able to provide the, for their protein. Um, we're in the process, um, af after we had a flood this last year, of rebuilding all of our systems so that all of our animals will have uh, good grazing areas, good outdoor areas to be able to free range. Um, right now we have a small area out back here that is used for their free ranging, but eventually we have these large areas um, that we'll be using to uh, allow for our goats and also our chickens and our ducks and our rabbits and our turkeys to all be able to spend time foraging as they would in their natural setting. So one of the things about permaculture that is so uh, successful is that we integrate rather than segregate. and. One of the ways we do that is that our animal systems integrate with our agriculture systems and our aquaculture systems so that all of the nutrient and feeding could 
uh, can happen happen in a cycling system uh, rather than us having everything as a separate system. So all of these animal systems feed our our our, our veget vegetation systems, and um, this particular areas where we actually work with our young hens uh, this is what we call our brooder house and we have our young uh, egg laying hens are just getting to size before they're introduced into the full flock and um, this is also made of clay sand and straw and then we use things like old trailer doors and uh, materials that we find on hand that were left here um, before we even came here so we're reusing materials to be able to meet our needs rather than to buy new materials and cause more mining to happen in the world. We, we can recycle so many wonderful things like this. So we have uh, uh, over, over 75 uh, laying hens and we have uh, about 25 birds that we call broiler birds that we are uh, helping to provide the food needs for, from the farm here. One of the ways the hens actually um, help us out is by providing eggs. This is a cob uh, laying area where the chickens love it uh, when they come in here, like this little happy hen's laying an egg. And you can see a lot of the other eggs that we have right here right now that were laid just in the last hours. So this is one of the, uh, the yields of our chicken systems. And uh, we love to have our eggs out here. Um, we've got some happy hens here. So one of the things that uh, we look at when we see a chicken, we don't just look at it as this, uh, this animal that's producing eggs and meat, what we do is we look at a chicken and say, what is its intrinsic characteristics? How was it, how did it develop as a chicken? And one of the things that we have uncovered and we've found out is that chickens are actually forest animals. And we're in the process right now of creating food forest where our chickens can actually be in their native setting. And so until those tree systems get up and going, um, we're having to create shade for them that would be in their natural setting. The other thing that is very interesting is that chickens naturally prefer insects over seeds and grasses. And so um, the more we can create habitat where insects are prevalent, the more they can actually eat their, their native food. And so we're in the process of creating and developing a series of movable uh, chicken pens called egg mobiles that will be working in a partnership with our developed tree systems to be able to move them around regularly so that they can be a part of our pest integrated pest management system. So chickens, not only do they produce eggs and meat, they also are uh, great insect, uh, they, they eat the insects that can cause damage to our, our systems, our, our uh, vegetable systems. And so uh, we use chickens regularly as part of our pest management. The other things that they do, um, they are also wonderful um, tractors that lightly tractor the soils and prepare them before we plant. So we can run a chicken tractor um, along a growing area that we're about to plant and they'll prepare it for us and then we plant after they move through. So we get, we're get we getting really creative on how to integrate our chickens into uh, creating fertility and abundance. Every day, twice a day, all of our goats get an opportunity to go on what we call a goat walk where they actually go out and forage freely on the landscape and they get a chance to just be in their natural setting, um, be able to eat from the land and get the diversity of food sources that help them to be healthy without uh, antibiotics, without um, supplements. They, they basically are getting their nutrition as a goat would in nature. Here, here we are in our first test of a food forest system uh, here at Quell Springs. Uh, the land you see just three years ago was completely barren. Um, this, these were all planted three years ago on earthworks that actually helped to harvest, passively harvest the water to slow it, spread it, and sink it, and also to passively harvest nutrient so that these trees can really grow. What we've done is we've mimicked a lot of the ancient food forestry systems that exist around the world that have fed people for generations. Uh, food forestry uh, provides one of the highest amounts of nutrition per square foot as opposed to an orchard system. When we first got here and we started planting a food forest, we had an orchardist from uh, Santa Barbara come and say, you have to rip out half the plants because they're planted so close together. And then within a couple of weeks from that, 
that same uh, from from the orchardist coming here, we had a, a food forest expert come from Australia and said, "You have to double the amount of species that you have in your food forest because essentially what we're doing is we're mimicking the structure of a forest to be able to create the highest amount of abundance and with the least amount of work." through many generations to come. And so we have a lot of different things from different fruits and vegetables, root crops, vines to support species um, that are growing in symbiosis like a, uh, a forest in nature would be doing it, but we're doing it with food species and beneficial species to grow the nu nutrition in the soil or to grow the fertility. So these types of trees here are actually fixing nitrogen from the air and putting it into the soils and creating a protection from our intense sun here so that a lot of these other plants can grow and be vital. So this system has been very successful, this three-year-old system, and we're going to be expanding this by several acres over this winter. This particular area I'm standing in um, about eight years ago when we moved here was a completely hard pan compacted area where the cattle were loaded into the trucks and so this area was absolutely devoid of vegetation and now as you can see after just a few short years this area has become vibrant. Um, we have a series of small ponds that draw in the uh, toads and uh, frogs to be part of our integrated pest management and then of course we can grow wonderful things like this typha or cattail which is a wonderful food and also a material for basket making and thatching and all sorts of good stuff. Um, this, these trees that you see above me are just about six years old and they're already about 30 feet tall. So all of these trees are either fed directly from rainwater and passive harvesting or they're a part of an irrigation system from our springs. Now, when we first moved out here, um, this land, uh, the, the springs were thought to have died. They thought that they had dried up and we were able to get this property for very aff affordable price because of that. And yet there's practices that you can put into place that actually rebuild springs. I go all over the world rebuilding springs um, in everywhere, all over East Africa as well as in West Africa and we can rebuild these springs no problem and that's what we've done here. We've gone from having no water in the day and a couple gallons at night to just today in mid-August we had 35 gallons of water in the middle of the day and we'll have well over 65 or 70 tonight and that water is gravity fed all the way down. Um, that's working with the, the natural propensities of, of gravity to be able to provide the water under pressure without having to put in fossil fuels or even to create a solar system that would pump those, those, uh, uh, the water to be able to use it for irrigation. So what we've been able to do is develop a gravity-fed irrigation system that doesn't use any pumps whatsoever and it's super efficient, very ecologically sound, and it's very inexpensive over the life of the system. These trees are all watered in a way that works beautifully with dry land. We bring the water right to the trees. We bring it right to where it's needed. We put it under mulch. Everything you see here is mulched so that we don't lose any water to evaporation and that's how these trees get so big so quick. We can rebuild the deserts. We can green the deserts of the world. There's no problem in that. We know how to do it. It just takes the political will for us to go in and look at agriculture in a completely, totally different way that's holistic in nature and works with the natural systems that exist on those landscapes. We can do it. We can do that right now. We can green all the deserts. We can stop the soil erosion. We can build fertility wherever we choose to. We have that capacity. Why aren't we doing it? That's what we need to, that's what we need to do. You need to go, I ask you and plead you, to you that you make purchases that build soil. I believe that real patriots build soil. We have to build our soils to be able to maintain our fertility for us to be able to live as human beings on this earth. And so the choices you make by buying products that are soil building products are super important. That's something you can do today to shift how practices that are denuding the earth can change towards sustainability. One of the things that happens when you develop a site that's successful is that you get asked to go to different places of the world to share what you've learned. And I've been very fortunate to be asked to repeatedly go to Africa. I've, I spend a lot of time there. I'm actually teaching in Jordan this next month in the Middle East. Um, I'm going to be teaching all over Europe next year. And 
one of the one of the beauties of permaculture is that it comes into when you bring permaculture into an area it actually recognizes and acknowledges the indigenous knowledge that exists in those places and it's an exchange that happens we don't go in and do aid projects there is no such thing as um, an aid project in permaculture we go out there and we share information I bring information I learned from the Africans back here and implement it here to be more sustainable they take the information that I bring and they help to rebuild and, and, and make abundant systems for their people from the knowledge that we share. And there's this great exchange that's going on. Um, this last year, I, I did projects uh, and taught courses in Kenya, in Uganda. Um, also, I've spent a lot of time in post-war Liberia helping to rebuild some of the ecologies of that landscape and working with former child soldiers to help them heal while they're helping the landscape heal um, from the travesties of war. And um, it's been a wonderful journey and so much um, has been learned that's been applied to our system and when you go over to uh, when you go over to these sites in uh, permaculture sites in in Africa that we've been working on you can see the abundance in comparison to the places that aren't using permaculture ethics and principles and it's a beautiful testimony to it, it, how well it works when you work with nature when you start to work with natural processes, you, you have less inputs, you have more outputs that are healthy, and you have closed loop systems where there's no waste, there's better health, um, we have less debt. Um, we, we spend a lot of time teaching people how not to get into debt and how to actually create abundance using natural capital. And that's something we need to do here in America. We need to invest in natural capital. We need to pull our money out of the tenuous stock market that so many people are watching because so much is hinged on it, and we need to convert it to natural capital. More and more, I'm getting people coming to me saying, could you help me reinvest my money into something that, that has basis that if the money, if, if the dollar no longer has value, that I have something of value to share with the future generations of our community. And so converting our economic capital now to natural capital should be one of your top priorities, as I know it is for us. Behind us here, um, we're going to be heading over and looking at this beautiful cob, hand-built, hand-sculpted house. Uh, cob, a lot of people think of as uh, corn on the cob. And, uh, but this isn't a corn on the cob house. This is actually clay, sand, and straw. The word cob actually roots the etymologically as a roundness in a circle, like a cob web, or a corn on the cob is the roundness of that cob. This is a cob because when you build the house, you build, you, you stamp with your feet um, the mud, the straw, the water, and you bring it all together to a consistency that's good for building and then you make these round balls that they call cobs and then you throw that cob up to the person that's building it on the top of the wall and you do layer after layer you build these beautiful monolithic structures that are elegant they're thermally efficient they're very inexpensive and they're just beautiful come on let's go have a look and so this uh, very simple and elegant mud house is only six thousand dollars to build and was done in about a year with the help of about 75 people helping from two-year-olds to 80-year-olds coming and mixing mud and helping to layer it up into this beautiful structure that houses uh, that can house a person beautifully. Um, this is also one of the structures that is illegal on the landscape. Um, there, there are many reasons why this is illegal. One of them is, is that a primary, a primary dwelling has to be over 750 square feet to be legal. This is only 610 square feet. Um, a lot of the laws we're finding have been developed around industries profiting, not necessarily health and safety, and yet that's the banner that they fly. Um, we, we have a lot of aspects of this building that um, make it safe, but yet those aspects that make it safe are also illegal. Looking at just the foundation here, this is a rubble trench foundation where we've built a monolithic building on top of a, a foundation where there's no, uh, there's no concrete holding it and anchoring it below the shear point on the ground. So what happens is in an earthquake with these cob buildings, if you build them monolithically, they're very different than adobe because adobe has all the breakpoints. This has no breakpoints. Points. This is solid stone, basically, and the longer it sits here, the longer it um, it becomes stone. Um, and in fact, uh, this foundation 
is going to help it through an earthquake rather than the concrete foundation that would make it more legal. Um, also, this as a building material, we cannot use this as a, as a primary structural support um, type of building material. It's illegal in most counties in the state of California. Um, however, there's been a lot of research showing its superiority to a lot of the industrial materials as well as its cost benefits. Um, the thing that keeps it from being legal, I believe, is that it is so readily available, the materials for free, that the industries that own a lot of the regulations, where they own a lot of the processes of, of how regulations get developed, um, they are afraid of having materials like this being legal because people can build the $6,000 house. Because when you build a $6,000 house, you no longer have a mortgage. And most people don't know what mortgage actually means. The actual name of a mortgage means a death contract. It, it has the same root of the word uh, mortuary and mortician. And it's, it's mortgage is a death contract. And what we're trying to do is to try to show that there's ways that we can, as communities, build our own structures and not have to uh, step into a system of economics that is skewed towards the international bankers and, and banking systems where we're spending 30 or 40 years of our life paying for a house um, every single year, every single day. It's almost a form of slavery, I believe. And this is a way that we can step away. You spend one year of your life building your house. You owe nobody any money, and you can live beautifully. This house takes no energy to be able to keep it cool at, in our hot summers or keep it warm in our very cold winters. We're at 3,800 feet and we're covered with snow out here in the winter. And um, oftentimes we have snow and deep freezes, it gets down to zero and we don't need any additional energy input to keep this warm or cool in the summer. And yet the way the state codes are written, we wouldn't be able to use this just because the energy calculations, uh, they don't consider a lot of the things that are naturally passive solar and other aspects of building and thermal mass as part of the energy calculation. So it's illegal in that aspect as well. Um, my hope is, is that through some very good research, working and partnering with universities, like we're developing a partnership right now with Cal Poly um, up in San Luis Obispo to actually do the research on these buildings to be able to share on the state level how um, safe these buildings actually are and how we can make them safer. I really want to work with the Ventura County Building Department, but they have so many limitations on them to be able to even consider something like this because of the way they're structured to minimize their liability and shift their liability to the state. So there's a lot of work to be done and we need your support in being able to do that. We really need support and you need to support organizations around your area that are pushing the edge of, of truly creating a sustainable future for our grandchildren and, our, and their great-grandchildren. Well, I look at uh, Ventura Cool. Um, uh, v Cool is a wonderful organization with Rachel Morris. I look at the uh, organizations like uh, Pesticide Free Ojai, are organizations that are working to minimize the toxicity exposure to all beings living within the Ojai Valley. I look at um, other you know, people, like uh, look at what Steve Sprinkle's doing with his farm, his, his ecological farming practices, and teachers like David White, who are uh, working out at different um, uh, sites with youth, teaching people, teaching the younger, the next generation, how to develop uh, practices that make sense for the next generations. Our young people right now know there's something not right. And I find that they come to us oftentimes saying, I, I have no hope for my future. And what we're trying to do is to say, hey, no, let's get to work. Here's a shovel. Here's some knowledge here. Let's go and change the future right now. And we can do that. We can change the future. And through the practice of being the change we want to see in the world, we can actually send a concentric wave out into the world that truly will affect the, not just the people, but also the ecologies in a positive way um, in, in future generations. And I'm, I'm so um, such a big believer that we have that power to make the change. I, I think there's, a, there's an important distinction we need to make between what's needed now for the, the 21st century that, we're, that we've embarked upon with all of the different ecological issues that are going on, the social unrest, the social injustices where you know, such a small, less than 2% of the people have um, you know, over 80% of the, of the wealth. And you look at 
the basic corporate takeover of American government. And we are one of the worst run governments in the world and one of the most corrupt governments in the world, but it's done through corporate takeover. And we, as the people, have a right to build our own shelters. We have the right to grow our own food. Those are inalienable rights that were assumed in the initial um, development of our constitution. And it is something that we have to, we have to take it back. Um, the governments and the corporations don't, um, they don't own our abilities to live beautifully on the land. And you see it in the people. We have, a, we have one of the most fearful populations in the world, in America. We also have the highest amount of people in jail per capita of any, um, of any um, uh, people around the world. And here it is, we're, we're, we're quickly showing ourselves to be one of the most unsuccessful models of governance that's ever been because of the destruction that we cause in the world. If every single person in the world lived like an American, we would need five Earths. And here it is, we go around the world exporting an unsustainable manner of development. And we have to shift. Each of us has to shift. We have to look and say, what is our fair share? What is our fair share that we can take in this beautiful flowering earth that doesn't diminish the capacity of future generations to be able to take their fair share? Well, I'd like to uh, welcome you into this beautiful Cobb House. Come on in. Let's have a peek. So one of the things that we do is we augment, we can augment the natural passive solar with a small wood stove like that, but we don't need it to be comfortable in here or to stay above freezing. Um, this, this beautiful house is uh, very thermally efficient and uh, takes absolutely no energy to keep it um, at a comfortable temperature year-round. Um, right now it's in the middle of summer in August and it's just a beautiful temperature in here. It's very comfortable. Um, this house, uh, a lot of times uh, the people who work with Cobb consider it to be a hand-sculpted house because you're literally doing it with your hands and not a lot of tools. Um, the thing that's so beautiful about Cobb, you can find them all over the world. And in uh, England alone, there are over 70,000 Cobb houses that have been continuously inhabited for over 200 years. And those houses actually fetch a higher price on the market than their conventional counterpart because of their efficiency and also because there's an elegance to it. You can see the curvature that's in here. You can see the um, there, there's, a, there's a feeling that's a lot more organic. These houses are also breathable. Um, we, we don't seal houses up in a natural building um, because you, you get stagnation in it. Um, a lot of the black mold issues that you get in conventional houses have to do with the impermeability of, of the wall systems. Um, and it's, it's an important part of keeping a healthy home. And you think about how much time you spend just even sleeping um, in a home and how much you're exposed to in that, uh, in that environment. Um, and if that environment's not a healthy environment, you're spending a good chunk of your life in a non, an unhealthy environment that could lead you to being ill or, um, uh, or just not, not healthy. One of the things with Cobb that's so beautiful is that you can just create niches everywhere. You can find, you can sculpt out areas. This is the bottle that was found at a thrift store that makes up a window for the morning light. So the east is right here and this beautiful morning light comes in. Um, we also even have a, uh, a niche right here because there's a little girl that lives here on the land that um, the people that live in this house, they put little tiny, uh, what they uh, call, call a fairy niche here. So they, they put little things for that little girl to come and check in. And here's like a little tiny fox. And so even the little ones um, have a place for themselves in, in a house like this. I just, I love its organic nature. Absolutely love its organic nature. All of the windows in this house, all of the doors in this house are all recycled, uh, rebuilt, and then married directly to the, the clay itself, um, usually with a wood uh, uh, framework, but that there's no toxic caulking that's used at all. Uh, which a lot of the, um, the codes actually mandate a different type of joinery that you would have to use to uh, make sure that these, these windows are completely um, sealed up, so to speak. But we don't do that. We don't put the toxicities into this environment. This is actually a cob countertop with linseed oil on it so that you can wash it. And then this is an old recycled uh, 
uh, sink system that someone was thrown out, so they decided to use that as a, as a simple T-sink tea, tea here. And you don't have to be a master craftsman to put something like this together. Um, generally, what you do when you're doing natural building is you get one person who um, you get one person who is uh, a skilled natural builder who then runs a community building workshop that many people can come who don't have a lot of skills to actually learn how to do the process. In the building of this house, we had uh, 10 people come to learn the process. And um, one of those ladies in her late 50s actually went and built her house over the next two years in Arizona. She was able to take what she learned in one 10-day workshop and actually build her own house. So and that's someone who had never built a house before. Well, I'd like to thank you for joining us today and visiting our farm here at Quail Springs and uh, looking at a little bit of the permaculture work that we're doing uh, to better the lives of of all of humanity and um, thank you for coming today uh, there are a few th if you're interested in learning more about permaculture learning more about who we are we have a website uh, at www.quailsprings.org and you can go onto our website we have a whole host of programs we have a full permaculture certification program coming up in uh, end of October into November it's a two-week residential program that um, that teaches the and certifies you in permaculture and it's a really exciting program. Um, we also have a program for a per permaculture program for people interested in international development and social entrepreneurship in two-thirds world countries and that program is going to be happening next year and uh, you can go on our website and find more information about that and we have internship programs and we have a lot of other opportunities for you to interface with some of the teachings that are coming through our work here. Um, we also are a nonprofit organization and rely upon um, not just our programs which provide most of our income but some people help us with donations to build our capacity here and if you'd like to help with that or help us plant our new food for us this winter we could use some extra funding for that as well and you can you can donate to us online um, but most of all I ask you to make choices that are conscious in your day-to-day -day living where you are right now whether you never make it out to Quail Springs or ever go to our website is to really look at through the eyes of awareness of how you're affecting the world around you by the purchases you make, by the ways you get your food, by the way you live in your house and live in the world that you, that you live in, whether you're in the middle of Ventura County or you're out in some other part of the world, is to make conscious choices that support the capacity of the next generations to be able to flourish beyond us. The last, I, I mean, we're at a point where we have to stop stealing from our grandchildren to feed ourselves. And you can do that by just making some simple choices. The other thing that you can do today that's important, and I believe one of the most important things you can do is to grow a garden. If you're not, if you're one of those people out there protesting the world, all the different things going on in the world, all the corporate inequities, and you're not growing a garden, um, and you're buying your food through systems that are supporting that, um, you're feeding it. And um, it's, it's inequitable that you um, are trying to counter something that, is, uh, that you're also feeding. We need to shift from that. And one of the best ways to do it is to grow a garden. There are so many ways that you can, you can better the world around you by just making conscious choices, whether it be um, the the way the, the the lessening of the driving that you do to um, taking vacations that make sense. With all the things that are happening out in the world today that are seem so negative, when I look in the news and I'm looking in the newspapers and seeing how many maladies are stri striking uh, here at home and abroad, but we have to remember that we have to keep hopeful for the next generations to see that there's a possible future that's beautiful, bountiful, and flourishing. And it's that hope followed with closely by our positive actions of taking and growing our gardens, of making good choices with our dollars, and, and not having to vacate our life to go and spend a bunch of money at Disneyland when we can actually go out in the world and, and even just take a vacation near home and go and plant trees. There's so many things that we can do to better the world around us. And I know that you'll join with us in that journey so that our children's children will have a beautiful life to come. Thank you.